Welcome. Welcome to this conference in connection with, the, with our great uh, Utopia project, which is supported by the Nordea Foundation. Welcome to our international guests, to the uh, representative of the Nordea Foundation, and welcome to all who have come here today to hear about and participate in the discussion of the Utopia concept and as it will be unfold today and tomorrow. Even the possibility of having this conference and especially of having the three-year project Utopia where we have shown colossal installations by Zhou Hongxiang, Katharina Grosse and Olaf Wuhr Eliasson uh, with all the activities that followed them, um, that seemed utopian. Today, uh, when it is impossible to establish large and transgressive projects within the economic framework around the museum, it is fantastic that we have an institution like the Nordea Foundation, uh, which will go all the way when it is necessary to think big. So a warm thanks to the Nordea Foundation, which has enabled us to realize a project which we would otherwise have regarded as utopian. Already now I have used the word utopia and utopian in a wider context than is strictly warranted from a pro professional point of view. However, the problem with the utopian concept is that it has become so dependent on its context, especially filled with theories of emancipation, uh, which have led to gigantic amounts of death and destruction for millions of people through the ages, so that one may come to doubt whether it is at all a possible framework for thinking. Nevertheless, the utopia concept is necessary in connection with the thinking about change and difference. Indeed, it seems quite natural that the deliberations concerning Utopia should take place here at Arkin. There is something utopian about the very establishment of Arkin. Normally, a museum is established when there is a collection which is regarded as having such a degree of quality that it must be preserved for posterity, so that later generations may also benefit uh, from it. However, in connection with Aachen, the exact opposite procedure was followed. First, a building was constructed, and then we started building up an art museum with a collection, professional research into art and dissemination in connection with exhibitions and publications, etc. Aachen is the realization of the dream of the politicians in what was then the county of Copenhagen, that also the inhabitants of the area west of Copenhagen were to be or to have the possibility of meeting art in their own surroundings. With the establishment of Aachen, they wanted to ensure that art would become an integrated part of everyday life for these citizens. <coughs> there was a strong belief in the emancipatory potential of art so that it was felt that so many people as possible should have a chance to be confronted with it. It is an expression of recognition of the fact that in each good work of art there is a utopian endeavor. And it is this utopian endeavor which we try to transform into a process of cognition for our visitors here at Aachen. If we look at the concept of utopia from a historical point of view, we find it in the myth of Atlantis, the island with the happy people who live in peace and plenty without material want. We meet it in the description of the Elysian field in the fourth book of the Odyssey, where Radamantus reigns, joys ever young, unmixed with pain or fear, fill the wide circle of the eternal year. Stern winters smile on the auspicious clime, the fields are florid with unfading prime. 
from the bleak poles no winds inclement blow, mould the round hail or flake the fleecy snow, but from the breezy deep the blessed inhale the fragrant murmurs of the western gale. Again a place with peace where people are protected from the inclement nature. The Roman poet and historian Pliny worked out a more detailed description uh, of an ideal community on the moon. A more precisely defined social utopia can be found in Thomas More's Utopia from the beginning of the 16th century. It is really the basis of the more precisely defined utopias and dystopias of the following centuries. Thus, we can see that art, as the idea of utopia, has developed from a mirage to instrument of power, and that it has been both an emancipatory as and as a breakdown of norms. Emancipation has often been connected with freedom from want and from unjust treatment from the authorities. The breakdown of norms appear when a new order is established in the utopian vision to replace the existing one. This utopian idea can thus both create optimism and hope and nostalgic melancholy. In connection with the postmodern thinking of the 1980s, the idea that there was a grand model which would solve all social problems was severely attacked. It was established that involvement in reality was striving for power and that the grand ideologies that were supposed to solve all the problems of society always meant that individuals were crushed. We remain aware of this terrible experience here at Aachen when nevertheless we try to re-establish utopia as a place for free thought. From our point of view, the utopian endeavor can be described as a wish to create a free, a free space for thought. Our utopian endeavor is to set free wild thoughts, to liberate the thought that allows itself to transgress all logical systems, all predictable conclusions based on det deduction and experience, a way of thinking which on the basis of a totally bodily experience or being approaches an insight which may be of emotional, intuitive, or pre-intellectual nature. It is a strategy for free cognition, which is known from free artistic endeavor, which does not try to dominate the experience or insight of others, but which, in respectful dialogue with the surrounding world, develops both as a self and as a part of a whole. It seems that at the same time as we accept Descartes' division of life into being and thinking, subject and object, inside, outside, closeness, distance, in connection with his dictum cogito ergo sum, and especially dubito ergo sum, as a basis for research into art, we add to our approach to art and our understanding and communication of it Merleau-Ponty's view that we are inextricably caught up in life, that we cannot see life from a distance, that in fact our whole bodily being influences our understanding of art. We distance ourselves from the way modernism searches, to, searches for harmony on the basis of disintegration, accepting disintegration discord as a prerequisite for creativity. In contrast to the attempts of former times to describe in their utopian visions uh, what was ultimately a harmonious society, we accept discord as a creative and positive fact of life, which does not just respect the logically deducted conclusions as a final goal, but also as a springboard for a new series of reflections. We wish that the museum should always be alert and ready to move, always be aware of itself as a dynamic institution, an institution which is constantly updating its conception of itself in relation to society around it, of course, without compromising our basic values such as high artistic, scholarly, 
and community, commun communicative qualities. Taking art as a point of departure, it has always been the task of the museum to communicate man's wonder at life. And that also happens within the Utopia project. By observing the works by Cho Ang Zhang, Katharina Grosse, and Olafur Eliasson, uh, and by discussing them, an intellectual understanding of the works is established, with, uh, which is combined with the visitor's entrance into the works, into Ang Zhang's railway, ra railway carriage, Grosse's colored landscape, and Eliasson's fog-filled corridor, and a spontaneous bodily experience is experienced, which is, is established, which is pre-intellectual and augurs change and difference. Olaf Eliasson says that the dynamic and the movable is the core of his utopian vision. An opening where concepts like subject, object, inside and outside, closeness and distance are thrown into the air to be defined once more. Olafur thus works with a dynamic, changeable concept of utopia. Further, he says, to me, the utopian is bound to the moment, the instant between one second and the next. This is a cultivation of the moment uh, which takes its point of departure in Nietzsche's cultivation of the life-affirming now of the fullness of the moment and proceed to a cultivation of the sensation of the moment rather than systematic work leading towards an idea of an imagined utopia. It is this absorption, uh, absorption by spontaneous sensation which furthers pre-intellectual insight into the work of art and especially into the utopian endeavor which is found in all good art a striving for a deeper insight into the basic existential conditions for man, a utopian endeavor to overcome the wonder at the phenomenon of man, which has been the basis for thought since antiquity and which finds expression in philosophy as well as in art. The observation and sensation of the work of art and the resulting reflection and dis discussion lead to personal insight. As art historians, we must proceed in a systematic fashion and com communicate uh, what we can <coughs> demonstrate. Our personal subjective point of view is irrelevant in a text which is to be seen by a broader public. But there is no doubt that something is always left over when we have written about an artwork. There is always the ineffable, which cannot be formulated in words, that which is perhaps the real artistic dimension. <laughs> On the basis of this, I will conclude by saying it is utopian in an intellectual, is it utopian in an intellectual culture like ours, seeking harmony to imagine that the spontaneous, non-verbalized experience of art can be accepted just as well as the experience which has been formulated intellectually and clearly. That that about which it is not possible to talk is the real essence of art, which remains when all questions have been answered, and that it may be reached through a spontaneous experience of art in the museum. I think that Anshan, Grosse, and Eliasson have shown that this is possible. And with these words, once again, welcome to the conference and I now pass the floor to Camilla Melvin. Thank you. Thank you. I'm the cu curator at Arken, and uh, today I speak in the capacity of organizer and moderator of this event. And I want to add a few more words, not the first, the last words you're going to hear today, uh, to the concept of utopia in general second to Arkans Utopia project in particular, and finally I have a few practical remarks. Why Utopia? You might have asked yourself this question, 
It is worth asking in a time that in many ways seems more anti-utopic than utopic. Nonetheless, there's no doubt that utopia as a concept and a mode of thinking has returned to critical discourse. Just the immense production of books about utopia and related subjects of the past decade bear witness to this sustained interest. Likewise, parts of contemporary art have also fostered projects that can be called utopian, since in one way or another they deal with the utopia or somehow operate in a utopic fashion. We shall see more of this in the coming two days, but I'm mentioning it here as part of the background for this conference. The other part is of course made up of the Free Year Utopia project at Arkin, which up until now has consisted not only of free large-scale installations, but also of film and talk, uh, film and talk program, uh, of various educational uh, and outreach activities. And now this conference, which if not in itself verify, then at least hopefully will make clear that utopia persists to matter. Christian has already talked about utopia and its possible meanings. Thomas More was mentioned, the English statesman and author. In his novel, Utopia from 1516, no surprise, a cornerstone within utopian studies, he locates utopia in the new world, not far from either Nolandia or Happy Land. But we're giving no more detailed description. In fact, just at the moment when the seafarer Ra Raphael, who has been in utopia, and is now giving his account of it, is about to pass on the location to Thomas More and the narrator of the book, Peter Giles. A servant is coughing so loudly that another of them can hear what is said, with good reason, as etymologically, utopia is the place that does not exist. Utopia is what it is by not being. Whereas for more utopia first and foremost designated a place, it has later become a literary genre and a concept with many meanings and agendas not least. In the following, I'll point to a few of these meanings and ways of understanding utopia, and the next two days will no doubt offer even more. In his book, Archaeologies of the Future from 2005, the American critic Frederick Jameson distinguishes between utopia as program and utopia as impulse in order to discern the utopian form from the utopian wish. To program the utopian form belong urban planning, revolutionary practice, and alternative societies. Here, utopia features as a formulated ideal, as a concept that is defined by its content. This definition of utopia as program, a subject in itself, is very much at stake in Arkin's first utopia exhibition, the Chinese railroad carriage by Zhuang Chang. From the outside, it looked exactly like that, a train, albeit strangely derailed out of its way. Once inside the carriage, the visitor could see documentary film clips showing scenes from Chinese history, a history brutally marked by Mao Zedong's attempt to realize a communist utopia in the form of the People's Republic of China. In between the film clips, silhouettes of people in different situations were shown, demonstrators clashing with the police, chess players wearing gas masks, gas mask, party goers monitored by electronic eavesdropping, all caught in a shadow play underscoring the dystopian specters of utopia. Clearly, this work took utopia and its failures as its subject. Now, utopia conceptualized as impulse might seem more abstract and hence more difficult to give a clear picture of. Frederick Jameson includes political theory and reforms in his list. He mentions the individual building as a response to the master plan of urban planning. But with what is most important in this context is his reference to hermeneutics, since he thus makes utopia a mode of seeing rather than a specific place, a mental act contrasting with a topographical location, something detectable by a specialized interpretive method, as he writes. 
This shift from perceiving utopia as a descriptive category to seeing it as an analytical concept, a method or hermeneutic tool is important, not only to Jameson's diagram, but equally to the utopia project at Aachen. When used as an analytical concept, utopia becomes a framing device that enables us to articulate the possible utopian impulse of a given work of art. It allows us, for instance, to conceive of the abstract space of Katharina Grosse as not just another version of painting in the expanded field, but also as a, and I quote, a constructive counter image to our, our everyday surroundings, a utopian no place that compels us to think beyond the existing circumstances to what, toward another better state. And I'm here quoting my colleague, Maria Lauerberg, uh, who's the curator of the Utopia Project, um, and she's writing on an exhibition. Let me move on to our current Utopia exhibition, The Corridor of Fog by Olavo Eliasson. What to make of it? A tunnel? A spatial construction? A sensation machine? Well, within the framework of Utopia, it can be conceived as a testing ground for new possibilities for new modes of experiencing and being that eventually might, between, might point towards what we do not know, or differently put, what is possible but is not yet. And I'm here using a key term from the German philosopher Ernst Bloch, whose writings from the first half of the 20th century have become a point of reference in the field of utopian studies, including his idea of the not yet as central to utopian thinking. When speaking of utopia in this way, in terms of possibility, potentiality, the not yet, the notion of imagination proves vital. In a number of unpublished lectures held in 1975, the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur distinguishes between reproductive and productive imagination. The concept of productive imagination is based on the idea that we can imagine something or a place that neither duplicates nor is predetermined by an original. According to Ricoeur, the productive imagination operates within the areas of religious imagination, poetic imagination, imagination, epistemological imagination, and social and cultural imagination. It is here in the area of social and cultural imagination that Ricoeur finds utopia, defined by him as the possibility of the nowhere in relation to our social condition. The possibility of the nowhere. I really like this definition. To use utopia as an analytical category, what I will here call to utopianize, one more word for the vocabulary, is exactly to insist on the possibility of the nowhere it is to insist on art as a performative and imaginary field of potential, characterized precisely by its ability to constitute a world rather than purely and simply represent it. And this, I hope, answers the question, why utopia? With utopia as methodological lens, the artwork becomes both an act of imagination and a true space of action that possesses the potential to change to point towards a different world, but also to create a new reality, or simply this, to do something. This, I hope, we'll do within the next two days of this conference, for listening and talking on and around the subject of contemporary art and utopia. And like Christian, I want to, to welcome you all, and most of all, of course, I want to welcome all the speakers. Thank you for coming, and thank you for traveling all this way and joining us here. <coughs> I am indeed looking forward to your presentations and the discussions that await us. I have a few practical remarks before we begin. Uh, from the program, some of you might have noticed that we, that we have had, um, that we have made a change in the initial program as we had a cancellation from Lev Manovich. And luckily, Stephen Duncombe was able to jump uh, in and is now on schedule for tomorrow. Today we'll go on until 5.30 and go straight out in the foyer where a light dinner and a glass of something await you. I hope you will all uh, join us for this. 
In the meantime, we'll have three speakers presenting today. And after see, uh, each speaker, there will be time for questions. Um, and we will have a more extended panel discussion and chance to sum up by the end of today and tomorrow. And as you might have seen, we are filming this whole session. And therefore, uh, when you pose a question, um, do remember to wait for the microphone to be passed on so that everyone can hear you and especially the recording system. Your name batch uh, gives you access to the museum, therefore carry it. And if you haven't done it already, do take time to visit the museum, especially the Utopia project during the lunch or coffee breaks. Now, I want to present to you our first speaker, uh, Richard Noble. Richard Noble is head of the Department of Art at Goldsmiths, which is part of University of London. He's the editor of the brilliant book Utopias from 2009, an anthology on contemporary art and utopia published in the Documents in Contemporary Art series. Apart from that, Richard Noble has written on a number of contemporary artists, including Anthony Gormley, Richard Whiteread, Mona Hatoum, and Mike Craig Martin. His interests are bro broadly in the relation between art and politics, and of late, this has focused mainly on the utopian impulse within contemporary visual art. Richard Noble contributed with an essay on art and utopia in the exhibition paper published in relation to the Katharina Grosse exhibition. We are therefore very happy to welcome you back at ARC and, and give you the chance to expand your thoughts and views and on art and utopia. Thank you.